the, this meeting of the Senate Finance Committee will come to order, our first one of the year, and a quorum is present. Um, um, we are going to start out by doing some brief introductions of members and staff for the committee, and just you can do your name, you can do your district for senators, and um, if anybody wants to say a sentence more about who they are or whatever, and I'm wondering if we could just start around the table if Senator Pappas wants to begin. Good morning, everyone. I'm Senator Sandy Pappas. My district is Senate District 65 in St. Paul. You're in my district well right now, so welcome. Go ahead, Senator Mohammed. Good morning, everyone. I'm Zaida Mohammed. I am the senator from South Minneapolis uh, in Senate District 63. Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, members. My name is Erin Murphy. I represent a district in St. Paul, District 64, which is the westernmost part of St. Paul. Thank you. Senator Westrom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, uh, I'm Senator Tory Westrom, represent Senate District 12, the far western part of the state of Minnesota. <laughs> um, Senator Pratt, I guess, is joining us by Zoom. I didn't know that, but I, Senator Pratt, are you here? I am, Mr. Chair. Uh, sorry, I got caught behind the accent this morning. Uh, Eric Parpatt, I represent Senate District 54, which is uh, Scott County. And we drive safely, and we'll see you in a few minutes. Then, Senate Council. Hello, Hello I'm Carlin Doyle Fontaine. I'm Senate Council. I'm here uh, today mostly because the there's the unemployment bill up uh, for Senator House Child today, and just filling in for Lexi Stengel. Um, as the new director, so I, you'll only hear, see me here at this table today. Thanks so much. Thank you. Mr. Nauman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Eric Nauman. I'm the principal fiscal analyst working with the fiscal staff in Senate Council Research and Fiscal Analysis. And apparently a froggy throat today. Sorry. Not bad. I'm John Marty and chairing the committee for the first time. Um, go ahead. Hi, my name is Elspeth Cavert. I'm excited to be joining as the uh, Senate Finance CA after six years of serving as Senator Marty's uh, legislative assistant. Hello, I'm Killian Becker. I'm Senator Marty's CLA for this committee. Good morning, everybody. I'm Senator Nick Frentz from North Mankato. Glad to be joining the Finance Committee. Good morning, and, and congrats to you, Mr. Chair, on your appointment as the finance chair. Um, Justin Eichhorn, I'm the senator from Grand Rapids. I serve Itasca, Cass, and Crow Wing counties, so it's the Grand Rapids and the Brainerd Lakes area. This is the first time I'm serving on finance, so I'm excited to be able to be part of this discussion on all the many important things that come through here. So thanks for the opportunity, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Senator Dames. Well, good morning, and uh, thank you for chairing this, uh, Senator Marty. We do appreciate it. I'm Gary Dames, and I represent Senate District 15, which is six counties in southwest Minnesota, starting at the edge of North Mankato and going to uh, over to the South Dakota border. So uh, appreciate the opportunity to serve on finance. Thank you. We have Senator Wicklin, who is in another committee right now, but has checked in, and um, from Bloomington, and Senator Champion, who I believe is, is either checked in or but he's going to be here soon, he said. Um, who is not here as well. Um, we also have our, maybe our two caucus researchers. Joey, go ahead. And from the corner, maybe the two pages can come out so people can know who they are and introduce yourselves as well. Thank you, and we're glad to have all of you here and so on. Just one or two little business items. We are going to, again, we're going to be having primarily in-person hearings, um, and, but I encourage people to bring computers. We are going to be obviously handing out all the bills and amendments and um, fiscal notes and so on, but for other handouts, when people have large handouts, we will tend to just have them posted online and sent to you by email. But if anybody wants hard copies of those, please let Elspeth know. We will 
I mean, short things that people come to us with lots of copies before a hearing we will hand out, but in order to not just be printing things that people aren't reading and so on, we will make them all available online, but if you want them, please let um, Elspeth know that you'd like to have paper copies of things like that. And today, with that, um, we have no other introductory business I'm aware of, but we have one bill on the table from Senator Hauschild, and while he's coming up, I'll mention that after this bill is done, we're going to have a presentation from MMB on the budget forecast overview um, and introductions of some of the MMB staff. So, Senator Hauschild, your first bill in front of this committee because it's the first bill in front of the committee. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Chair Marty and committee members. Um, I greatly appreciate the uh, expedition of this uh, legislation because it is uh, very timely, um, and I will get into that. Um, so thanks for the opportunity to testify before this committee on Senate File 40, the Iron Ore Mining Related Industry Additional Unemployment Benefits Program. Uh, before I begin, I do want to just take an opportunity to thank uh, Mayor Wade LeBlanc and Janelle Jones, who is the Lake County Chamber President and CEO, who are here today. Uh, they did testify yesterday on the Jobs Committee alongside a county commissioner and a United Steelworker representative. Um, and so I just appreciate them staying overnight on this really, really important issue in our communities. I want you to imagine for a minute that you work in a tough job like mining. You've worked there your entire life in an industry uh, that's really important to you and you work hard. Um, not very easy for us that wear suits every day uh, to imagine. You're proud of the work that you do. You provide for your spouse, your kids, and your family. Uh, but then one day it's announced that you'll be laid off for almost an entire year at no fault of your own. Not for a lack of working hard as you possibly could and giving everything you can to your work. You live in a rural community where there aren't a lot of options, a place where an announcement like this sends ripple effects across the region. You live in a place that is proud of, but also very reliant on your industry, where local businesses, grocery stores, mom and pop shops, and quite literally everyone in the community is reliant on your paycheck and your spending in the community. After months of being unemployed, your benefits are about to run out right as the winter and holiday months arrive. So we're done imagining because that's exactly what happened in my district to the miners at North Shore Mine in Babbitt and the processing pellet plant in Silver Bay. In May 2022, Cleveland Cliffs announced that they'd be idling the North Shore Mine in Babbitt and the pellet processing plant in Silver Bay. This resulted in approximately 410 workers at those mines being laid off in addition to some contractors that work directly on the mine in related industry. In July 2022, Cleveland Cliffs again announced that the idling at North Shore would extend until at least April 2023. Given that the workers' standard unemployment benefits would last until only November, I began calling for a special legislative session to address this workers' unemployment benefits, since we knew the benefits would run out before the 2023 legislative session began. After the election and with no special session on the horizon, I began immediately working on drafting this bill that would provide 26 weeks of unemployment insurance extensions retroactively applied to November that would last until April, which is again the date given by Cleveland Cliffs at the earliest possible reopening of the plant and mine. The unemployment benefits would come from the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund at a fiscal note of approximately $10.2 million. I want to thank uh, my colleagues across the aisle, Senator Justin Eichhorn and Senator Rob Farnsworth, for their support in this legislation, because the Iron Range is waiting for action. I hope that you will join me in heeding their call and support our workers and their families when they need it most. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Um, we did have a lively discussion during the Jobs and Economic Development Committee. Um, where a couple of discussion points came up regarding some of the dates for the unemployment extension. I believe those issues have been cleared up, but happy to answer additional questions. In addition, there was a question about whether or not the companies were reimbursable, and that in fact is not the case. Um, and then lastly, um, there was a discussion offline regarding the experience rating hit on Cleveland Cliffs for the repayment of the UI Trust Fund, and I believe there may be an amendment with regards to that issue. With that, I'm happy to yield to questions. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank 
you, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator House, House Child. Um, can you explain a little bit more about Cleveland uh, Cliffs and uh, do they have permits in front of the state of Minnesota for additional mining or what led to the layoff or the drop in production uh, in, in their company? And then I've got a couple of follow ups. Yes. So specifically to this mine and processing plant, uh, there is less demand for pellets for their company. And so right now there was, you know, these layoffs were really announced solely based off of the demand for pellets, which is what this mine and processing plant produce. Um, so it's not, it, you know, I guess I can't comment on, with regards to future permits or those, those types of things. From my understanding, it was purely an economic uh, demand issue for pellets. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't refer to the chair, and then, yeah, Senator Westrom, thank you for the question. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair and Mr. Senator Housechild, uh, is there other mining companies in the area? I We've heard for several, a few years now that there's permits. Uh, PolyNet is one of them that's uh, uh, trying to open up mines. What else is happening on the range to open up additional mining opportunities? Um, if you could fill us in on that. Uh, where, where are some of those uh, proposals at and uh, the permits in the process of, of, of what what is wanting to trying to come online and what is coming online and what has come online recently if you can give us kind of a, uh, a picture of that uh, for the rest of us that in the, in the state yeah thank you chair Marty Senator Westrom thank you for the question um, so the iron range is complex. There's a lot of economics, uh, economic movement, a lot of different companies involved in different mining permits. Um, I will make a distinction that the Cleveland Cliffs operations on the iron range are taconite mining, taconite ore, which has been the traditional mining in the iron range for the last 100 plus years. Um, there are two other, pro well, three, three other projects that are with regards to copper nickel mining, which is, I believe, what you were referring to. Polymet is one of them. That's out of the Hoyt Lakes area, which is in my district. The other is Twin Metals, which is up in uh, Ely uh, and near the Boundary Waters. And then the third is uh, Talon Metals, um, which is not in my district, but is a newer project on the horizon that are going through the process. Um, right now, Polymet is in uh, current uh, litigation with the DNR uh, and outside organizations, uh, sort of working through the re-admission of, of some of their permits. The Twin Metals, uh, currently there is a moratorium uh, by the federal government that is being considered um, on that project. And Talon, uh, um, you know, I, I can't comment because I'm less familiar with that project. Now, with regards to Cleveland Cliffs, um, there is also another taconite mining uh, company on the Iron Range, U.S. Steel, which many are familiar with. They also have operations nearby. Um, and there are some um, possibilities for future taconite mining projects from both of those companies that certainly happy to dive in on if we'd like. But, and Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Western. Uh, Senator House, House Child, thanks, thanks for that information. So. Are any of those other projects uh, at a point of starting, or are they still hung up in the permit process? It sounds like none of them have gotten through the years and years of permits to, to get started, or are any of them uh, at a point of, uh, of starting uh, soon? Senator Westrom, I... I <clears throat> can answer this quick and quickly, but I want to focus on the bill and not on the entire mining industry and everything else. I recognize that, that these are particularly desperate situations, but go ahead. I just don't want to get too far off track. No, no go ahead, Mr. Chair. I'm just, uh, you know, I'll, I'll so. I, depending upon the answer, sure. it depends upon my final comments. So I'm sure. trying to figure out, you know, what, what more can we do for Senator them. Senator Hauschild. Chair Marty, uh, Senator Westrom, thanks for the additional follow-up. Polymet, in particular, um, did have all of their permits in place at one time. Uh, that project was not started with those permits. Uh, since that time, there have been lawsuits um, from organizations challenging some of those permits. The DNR is, uh, is in court currently um, working through some of those issues. 
Um, and so if and when those uh, lawsuits are, are determined and decisions are made, uh, it is possible that PolyMet could move forward. I, I do not want to comment on the possibility of that or where those are at. Um, certainly, I'm a stakeholder in those given it's in my district, um, but, um, but that's probably about as far as I could comment with any real knowledge of the situation. Thank you, uh, Senator Housechild, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, just, just a observation. I guess I'm, I'm, I'm interested in knowing where things are at because uh, any of us that have been here a few years know it's probably been going on uh, five or ten years that some of these permits have been lingering in in uh, in, in anguish to try to get the jobs back up on the range, and I know uh, um, your predecessors, uh, Senator Bach, Senator Tomasoni, uh, were fighting to get these permits, and so I'm wondering if if another th action the legislature should take quick action on in addition to this is finding ways to bring more jobs back to, to the people that have been laid off that you're fighting for, and um, maybe we could look at an amendment to just open up the permits after enough years we we are we know we should be ready to move ahead and let let the jobs begin rather than just keep it in uh, administrative red tape bureaucracy uh, and, and and starve the people on the range from these jobs because those jobs would be great alternatives for uh, these uh, skilled uh, people that you're fighting for that are laid off in the mines, but they've got great skills in mining, and if there were other mining jobs up there. So I'm just wondering if we should be looking at a double-headed approach here and also open up the permits, and let's figure out what permits are being blocked for years and years and years and revisit that law and, and get this opened up so these workers can have more opportunities for mining up on up on the range. And uh, uh, this is just a Band-Aid approach. I think we need to uh, look at opening up the, the other mines that are, that are ready to move ahead and uh, all of these families would have more job opportunities as well as others that could move into the communities. And so I think this is a good time we need to highlight what's been uh, strangled uh, for years by the state government, and um, this is a Band-Aid solution, but it's, it's a solution that's needed because government hasn't acted in, in good faith or uh, has tried to, to uh, stop or delay these projects from starting, and they, they would be welcome to the, to the miners that are laid off and others in the community so we could have more jobs up there. And so I'm wondering if we could look at that uh, as this moves through the process because it seems like we need to uh, use this as an opportunity to really highlight what's been delayed up there and, and because of that uh, your miners and uh, families are, are suffering with, with fewer jobs and uh, not, not the opportunities that, that, that could be up there. And so I'm just wondering, uh, Senator Hosschild, if, if you'd be open to the, us also trying to improve the permit or expedite the permit process so we could get some of these other companies online to uh, help your help your mining families. Senator, we have um, Senator Friends and Senator Dames. I have Mr. Chair, that was a question to the author. Okay, Senator Hauschow, if you want to comment on that Chair. briefly, please. Chair Marty, Senator Westrom, thank you for the question. Uh, I don't think a single one of these workers uh, community leaders, business leaders, chamber members would like us to tangle up unemployment, immediate and urgent unemployment insurance for these workers who already have jobs, who have worked in mining perhaps their entire lives, whose communities are reliant on yeah. these paychecks, as I mentioned in my testimony, uh, to get this tangled up in another complicated uh, regulatory amendment or discussion. Now, with that said, I'm always happy to talk about these issues. Um, I know that they're important to my district, but right now what's before us is putting, uh, uh, putting workers at, at 
Give, giving workers hope in my district so that they don't move away from the Iron Range, so that they don't leave their communities, they don't pull their kids from their schools, they don't pull out of their spouses' careers, um, and that we keep our region strong and the workforce in the area for future uh, job opportunities. I also think it's really critical to note that the Iron Range is not just uh, mining jobs. Um, it is healthcare jobs. Uh, it's one of the largest solar manufacturers uh, up on the Iron Range. Um, we have uh, tourism uh, and timber as the other three-legged stool, timber, taconite, um, and tourism as uh, key portions of our economy. So this is not a one-size-fits-all solution scenario. Uh, it's really an all of the above for me. And right now, what I'm doing is trying to fill in where the legislature uh, fell down and, and did not uh, open up a special session to address this issue for our miners immediately. Uh, let's get the job done that's ahead of us uh, and happy to, to go into the deeper and much more complicated issue of regulatory uh, issues uh, should we want to in the future. I want to apologize. We did not have the bill in the packets. It's now been handed out. Um, I have Senator Friends and Senator Dames on the list, and then we'll go through the fiscal note. Senator Friends. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, Senator Hoschild, thank you. I share Senator Westrom's comments that you are fighting for iron range workers, and that's our focus today, and I'm glad to see bipartisan support for this move. Um, with that, Mr. Chair, I'd like to offer the A-8 amendment and make a comment. Um, Senator Friends offers the A-8 amendment. While that's being distributed, maybe you can explain it or discuss it or whatever or have whoever. Sure. Part of the urgency here, Mr. Chair and members, is that we need to get a deal done and get it out the door and get it signed by the governor and get these benefits to these workers. As a part of that, um, there's a question relating to the exception for employer ratings. The A8 amendment makes it clear on page 2 and line 33 that this exception does not apply to an employer described in subdivision one. That employer, of course, was the subject of testimony in the jobs committee, and I'd be happy to um, entertain any comments to the amendment by Senator Hoschild, but I'm hoping he considers it a friendly amendment, and my understanding is this amendment will make it agreeable to our friends in the other body and expedite these benefits getting into the pockets and purses of these workers. With that, Mr. Chair, I offer the A8 amendment subject to any comments of Senator Hoschild. Um, Senator Hoschild, on the A8 amendment, Thank you, Chair Marty. Senator Friends, thank you for the friendly amendment. I um, agree with uh, moving forward with, with that. Thank you. The discussion of the amendment. Senator Pratt. Oh, pardon? It has not been, oh, it's, I'm sorry. <clears throat> sorry, Senator Pappas. <laughs> Okay. Senator Pratt on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, we had quite the lengthy discussion about this in the Jobs Committee yesterday. I want to thank Senator Hostchild for uh, meeting after committee, uh, being uh, in communication uh, with me and others, uh, stakeholders, uh, co authors on this. Um, you know, as we've worked so hard to get the unemployment insurance trust fund back up to not fully, uh, not fully funded, not fully reserved, but to a point that it's um, uh, not in, uh, in deficit uh, is, is extremely important. And maybe, maybe through that experience, I've, I've gained a little bit of, uh, of a protective uh, stance around the, the UI trust fund. The whole reason we uh, fought so hard to get the UI trust fund back up to a reasonable level was for uh, situations just like this to make sure that that trust fund was uh, healthy and available for those who need it um, and and so I appreciate Senator Hoschild's uh, efforts on this last night I also uh, reminded him that there was another concern that we had that wasn't addressed in the amendment so Mr. Chair I'd like to make an oral amendment to the amendment Okay, Senator Pratt, on the an oral amendment to the A8 amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it would be uh, on the current engrossment lines, line 2.32, put a period at the, um, it, after employer, 
and strike the word and, and then, uh, and then strike the remaining of line 2.33 in the engrossment so it wouldn't affect, it wouldn't affect the balance of the AA amendment. On, yes. That would be as an amendment to the A8 amendment. Um, Mr. It, Mr. Chair, to that please, go amendment. Ahead. Uh, so we have two types of employers in the state. We have uh, taxpaying employers who pay into the system uh, on a quarterly basis. Think of it like your insurance premium. And then we have reimbursable employers who act as self-insured. And when they draw out of the, the unemployment trust fund, they are expected to pay those funds back. What we heard in the, in the jobs committee yesterday is there are no reimbursable employers. And so it seems to me that just for, for uh, let's, let's say, um, uh, clarity, that we shouldn't, have to, we shouldn't have to make an exception for reimbursable employers in this bill. Uh, is is this maybe I should ask if somebody from deed could speak to is this standard language in how we've done this? Hmm. Welcome to the committee and please identify yourself for the table. Thank you, Chair Marty. Um, my name is Evan Rowe, um, Senators. Uh, my name is Evan Rowe. I'm Deputy Commissioner for Workforce Services and Operations at DEED. My purview also involves the Unemployment Insurance Program. Um, I, we were actually just trying to get a copy of the most recent, of the engrossment, um, just so that we could track the oral amendment that uh, Senator Pratt offered. Uh, it's not on there. Sorry, uh, if, if I could just take a quick look at this. Sure. Thank you. Just, uh, uh, Chair Marty, just for, just, just, just for sake of clarity, um, the, the, it would, it would it would play it would place it would place a period at the, after the words tax paying employer on at line two point three two and then strike line, the remainder of that line and then line two point three three. Correct. Let's see. Okay. So the and sorry. Understood. Okay. Um, uh, to, to, the sen uh, to Senator Pratt's question, um, we were able to do. We did. We did some additional analysis last night based on the based on the questions that came up in the Senate Jobs Committee yesterday. There are, um, to our knowledge, right now about eleven reimbursing employers. It's a very small number of and a very small total number amount of benefits that's involved. But there are a few in the data set that are related to the layoff. Um, and again, we, um, that can come up due to schools, other other a variety of varieties of things. So, is is this language in the bill that this amendment to the amendment would delete? Is that standard language? Is this charging of benefits? Is that standard language? How we've dealt with these? It's it, yeah. It, it it's it has been done before. It is not. Um, it is not always. It is not always employed. It is. It, but it is it's similar to language that has been used in other additional benefits programs in the past. Senator Hoshaw, do you have any comments on the amendment to the amendment? I, no, I, as Chair Marty. Thank you. Uh, I don't have any comments. I would defer to Deed on whether or not it's. A reasonable oral amendment, Mr. Chairman. Senator Pappas. Uh, Mr. Chairman, could the person from Deed could you introduce yourself, please? Uh, yes, um, Senator Pappas. Um, uh, my name is Evan Rowe. I'm a deputy commissioner for workforce services. Deputy Stop. Commissioner Rowe. Thank yes. you, Mr. Chairman. Um, could you just please clarify then? Is Deed in favor of this amendment or opposed? I wasn't. It wasn't really clear. I, um, Chair Marty, uh, Senator Pappas. I think. 
we, we, having just gotten the amendment uh, uh, just orally right now, I think we're just trying to make sure that uh, we're clear about what it does. I think it, it, what, what this amendment would do, right, is it would basically, um, it would mean that a reimbursing employer who, generally speaking, are school districts are and, and or nonprofits, right, governmental entities are the ones that, are, that tend to be reimbursing employers, this would mean that they would have to pay the uh, unemployment insurance benefits for the you know, for the additional benefits authorized under this provision, right? Uh, uh, I think it's 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 a program administration error. It's it's broadly a policy question of whether you would want the schools and the nonprofits to have to pay the cost of those benefits or not. Our sense is that it's a it's not a um, tip. Yes, I'll, I'll leave it there. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Rowe, I'm, I'm a bit confused by your answer because the fiscal note prepared by deed on page two under assumptions, currently two employers have laid offs meeting the criteria of this bill, one in the iron ore and mining industry and one in the explosive manufacturing industry. <clears throat> so it's a bit of a surprise to me after the jobs committee hearing yesterday and now for the first time today hearing that there are 11 reimbursable employers that meet the criteria under subdivision one, um, which doesn't include school districts, hospitals, city governments, or anybody else. So can you please clarify your answer for me, please? Um, uh, Chair Marty, Senator, Senator Pratt, I, again, I think we've been try, um, in the spirit of trying to expedite the legislation and making sure that we're able to provide uh, the, the kind of relevant fiscal information. I think we were able to do a little bit more analysis last night. If, you, uh, if I could just have a, maybe a moment to Go check ahead. in, um, to just check in with the, uh, with the program director. Senator French, did you have something while he's checking on that? Sure, I'll, thank I'll be right back. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Pratt, for the amendment to the amendment. Uh, I would ask members to vote no on the amendment to the amendment. I think, first of all, we're getting testimony from Deed that this might involve some people that we didn't mean to involve. And second of all, I think this is language that we have used in the past for a similar type of benefit extension. And I think for consistency, and Senator Pratt, just throwing this out there, for the possibility of precedent being set, I, I think that a better approach would be to have this discussion amongst ourselves, to vote no on the amendment, and then to let the A8 amendment be approved, let this deal go forward and get these benefits to these workers. Just my two cents, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Friends. Senator Pratt, until... Uh, Mr. Chair, while we're waiting for Deed to uh, kind of get their, their uh, answer in line, you know, Senator Frentz, we had this conversation back in 2020 as well when we extended unemployment benefits during uh, COVID. And um, what we settled on was, was paying, um, paying that, uh, uh, that benefit out of cash, right? Because what's happening... Uh, what happens is basically you're pulling out of an insurance fund for somebody who's not paying it back, where those who are taxpayer employees will, in fact, be paying back part of this benefit. Uh, those reimbursables are, you know, for lack of a better term, getting a free ride. What my concern would be is that if we now have 11 employers that weren't considered in the fiscal note, this bill ought to be tabled and a new fiscal note be drafted. Because it's, if, if I understand Mr. Rowe, then it's an inaccurate fiscal note. I, Deputy Commissioner. Thank you. And um, thank you, uh, Chair Marty and Senator Pratt. I, my apologies for the confusion here. So I, just, to, just to clarify kind of exactly what we're talking about here. So the, lay, the layoffs related to the fiscal note are the layoffs from the two employers that we're talking about. However, due to the way that base periods are calculated under, uh, you know, under unemployment insurance law, there are, some in, there are some individuals who you know, maybe have part-time work, you know, who have had part-time work at, you know, say, one of the two employers in question, and previously were also employed at a school district or a nonprofit entity. So those periods of time are captured in their base period. So there would be some charges that would be you know, back attributed due to, the way that the, due to the way that the calculations of the base period applies the charging of the, of the UI benefits. But the nature of these additional benefits are for the two employers, as is, as is noted in the fiscal note, right? I mean, this is, so I guess, and again, my apologies for the incomplete answer previously. I think it's just kind of the, the nature of these provisions 
and, and, the, and, the, and the kind of specific impact of the fiscal note are related to these two employers, but there are going to be some individuals who, again, had multiple jobs over that time period, and therefore in the, in the back data, again, it might touch a fire department, it might touch a, it might touch a school. So. Okay. Thank you. That, that, that actually does help clarify because I was kind of confused how that happened. Thank you. Is there a further discussion on the amendment to the amendment? Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Mr. Rowe, is that included in the fiscal note? So, um, um, uh, Chair Marty, uh, Senator Pratt, yes, it is. Senator, Mr. Nauman, did you have any? So, Mr. Chair and um, Deputy Commissioner, on page two of the fiscal note, I'm just trying to try to cut to the chase here. The fiscal note estimates 10.266 of additional costs associated with these 26 additional weeks. Is there any reason to feel that the very last line on section uh, on the fiscal note, which identifies 490 eligible applicants, is an inaccurate number? Is it higher? I think, or or lower? I mean, to the best of your understanding, that number still remains valid. That that you pulled off the unemployment insurance calculations and you did the math for the fiscal note based on that. That is correct. So members, then that number um, is turned into a week. Uh, the, the fiscal note assumes a 100% exhaustion rate. So all of the employees that would be eligible are 100% exhausted. Maybe not yet, but it's assumed that this bill would cover it. Mm -hmm. And then multiplied by 26 weeks. I mean, for those 490 employees, their weekly rate is, in, is multiplied times 26 weeks to arrive at the number in the fiscal note. Correct. So even that there's some additional nuance here, the, the amount of the numbers themselves remain ac accurate. Yes. So, so in other words, the fiscal note's accurate. It's just a question who might be charged back because I may have worked for a school district before working for the mine before being laid off. Okay. Correct. Is there further discussion on the oral amendment to the amendment? Mr. Chair? Sir Pratt. I would, I would request members vote yes on this amendment. Um, what we're talking about are benefits that are being paid by, uh, by employers who are not paying into the system. And um, they should be, quite honestly. Um, it's, and, and I liken it to... Um, you know, your homeowner's insurance. If I'm, if I have an uninsured shed in my backyard, why should my neighbors be paying off my debt, my, de my, my loss, uh, when I'm not paying into the insurance premium pool? So, uh, I do request a yes vote on this. I think it's a fairly, uh, straightforward and reasonable, uh, change. And I appreciate Senator Hostile, uh, considering it during our discussion last night. Mr. Chairman, could we have a roll call vote? Sure, Senator Pappas requests a roll call vote. Any further discussion on the Pratt oral amendment to the A8 amendment? Um, if Mr. not, Mr. Senator Murphy. Oh, Senator, I'm sorry, Senator Westrom, I'm sorry. Mr. Mr. Chair, um, Senator Hauschild, um, if you could explain this a little bit more for, for us. Uh, are there... Who, who's the, the state of Minnesota is paying this, but are there entities that are getting benefits that aren't paying into the to the system? Can you explain that a little bit more? Chair Marty, Senator Westrom, thank you for the question. So the way that the amendment, uh, the A8 amendment is written, it would make it so that Cleveland Cliffs has an experience rating hit, which would essentially, uh, from my understanding, make them pay back into the UI fund. However, there is a contractor that only provide, from my understanding, only provides work at the mine for blasting that has five employees that we have added to the bill, and that is um, Dino Noble is the name of the, co of the company. And so what we have done, because that company, you know, had no decision-making process in the layoffs, but is directly tied to the, to the mine, we are exempting them 
from the UI um, re, uh, experience rating hit that would repay into the UI fund. And that is a discussion that I hope this is a, you know appropriate to comment on that Senator Pratt and Dreheim and I discussed offline uh, leading up to this finance committee meeting. So, Mr. Chair, Senator Housechild, that's one company that's not going to have to reimburse the UI fund. Is there any other companies or nonprofits or school districts or uh, other employers that, that are going to have benefits received and then not have to pay back in? Deputy Commissioner. Um, sen uh, uh, Chair Marty, uh, Senator Westrom, I think the 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 um, discussion. I, I think the discussion here has kind of gone down a kind of a very sort of rabbit hole on, or a very kind of a very deep area on um, just the way the that UI benefits are charged to employers, um, and the you know the way that the way that the to kind of put it briefly, the way that um, you know that a, if if, if you were to receive a UI benefit. Uh, the way that that the way that that benefit is assigned back to individual you know, back to employers looks back at your last several quarters of employment. So if you had, were in multiple, if you had multiple employers over that time period, um, there would be part. You know, there could be partial charges to um, to to those employ you know, to those different employers based on that base period. Um, so I, you know, if the if the last, you know, if the, um, um, so I, I think by you know, so again, I, I, what I would just say is it is possible. I don't think, um, however, at the same time, um, we largely, you know, um, we wouldn't. Um, we, we, I think we just kind of um, we wouldn't expect a, a a sort of large necessarily a large impact, um, but I, but I but I think that's um, but again the, I think what we're kind of talking about here is um, the base period here is it kind of extends back over several over several quarters. So, so Mr. Chair and Deputy Commissioner, uh, if I'm understanding your answer correctly, if some of these workers might have worked for the school district or the fire department or uh, some a nonprofit or some other group in some of those previous quarters uh, part-time or, or in full-time, they're going to be charged some of this uh, uh, unemployment extension or they're not going to be charged like normal and the state will just have to pay it out of the fund and everybody else paying into the fund will have to suck it up and pay, pay, pay it for them? Which, which of those two scenarios is correct? If you could help so, clarify that. Uh, uh, Chair Marty, Senator Westrom, so under the text uh, of the A8 amendment, of, of, or of, I'm sorry, under the text of the oral amendment offered by Senator Pratt, those, di you know, those districts and nonprofits would be required to repay those, those charges. Absent, you know, if the amendment does not pass, then those costs would be would would not be would not be factored in. Senator Hosha, Chair Marty, um, with that information in mind, I would strongly oppose the oral amendment. I don't want school districts, firefighters, hospitals, whatever it might be, uh, in my district to be charged for a decision that was made by a corporation, unbeknownst to the employees that may or may not have worked in other industries or areas. And these potential ones, if I understand right, these potential ones who could be with, if this amendment passed, who could be charged for it would be treated differently than the small employer that we're exempting from now because they weren't the cause of the layoffs. Mr. Mr. Chair, if I, can, if I can finish my Go questions. Ahead. So, so Senator Housechild, who will, who will pay that then if those entities uh, aren't uh, obligated to pay it because under the deputy commissioner's testimony that's the way the current UI system is set up that uh, the if there's previous work experience and previous quarters uh, that's part of how they come up with the, the the reimbursement to the fund so the fund stays whole and uh, entities the proper entities pay if you're going to extend benefits who, who will pay it otherwise 
Chair, Chair Marty, and maybe I could, I, can I ask a clarifying question then to Deed? So, in a, it, let's say there's another scenario that's similar to this, and workers work in schools, but they work for a company that lays off workers. What is the standard language that would be used for those schools reimbursing the UI trust fund um, as part of that layoff? So school schools are a, are a, 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 there, there's a kind of separate thing around school around schools and, and UI, I, which I think is under consideration this year. I, I think just so I make sure I understand yeah, the correct. question, just to, just to make sure I understand the question. Um, um, what you're wondering is kind of where, like, where the where the money would come from. Or? So, if 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 there are entities that are reimbursable mm -hmm. organizations, yes. and workers work at those entities, but then go to work for a private company yes. that is taxable, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. and yep. they are laid off, and mm -hmm. they provide are provided uninsurance. Uh, excuse yep. me, unemployment insurance. Yep. Do those reimbursable organizations get factored into the regular equation to pay in if they're reimbursable? So it looks, yeah, uh, th thank you. Thanks, yeah. thanks for clarifying that. So it, the UI system looks at all, you know, at, at a person's, you know, right. at, at a person's whole work history, regardless of whether they worked for a reimbursing employer, which is a relatively small percentage of employers in the state, or a tax paying employer as the two entities <laughs> Um, in question under this bill are so again the 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 answer is the answer is you know the answer is yes it looks at a person's entire employment the 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 the, the history regardless of the nature of the employer and the school district and would then thus pay into that. yes oh okay. yeah yeah I'm sorry in, in, a, in a short answer yes okay. they would and deputy commissioner in in effect like we do this both ways during COVID all employers were exempted from the experience rating thing. Uh, not maybe not all, but most of uh, much of the unemployment during COVID was exempted from chargebacks. The employers, Chair, uh, Chair Marty, that is that's absolutely correct. And uh, yes. Okay. Further discussion. Um, so if Mr. not, Chair, uh, Senator Westrom. I, I'm just not exactly clear, but maybe maybe the Deputy Commissioner could just answer it, or Senator Housechild. So, so whichever one of you can give me the answer, just who who will pay that. A benefit back to this UI fund if if the uh, those those entities we've discussed uh, aren't 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 paying the extra benefits that are getting allocated here if this passes, who who will pay? Just just that's the simple question. Um, Chair Marty, uh, Senator Westrom, those co those costs would be shared within the overall UI fund, right? So if it, if they are not charged back to the employer, they would be shared. They would be charged back to the overall unemployment insurance trust fund. Further, if not, Senator Pappas requested a roll call on the oral amendment, the Pratt oral amendment to Mr. the A8 Chair. amendment. Um, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, just, just to clarify, I understand um, it, it, certainly reimbursable employers have been a concern for a long time. You know, as, as Mr. Rowe said, uh, many of the reimbursables didn't pay back their, their COVID layoffs because we paid for it. We paid for it with cash. Um, we made the unemployment trust fund whole. When we extended benefits in December of 2020, we put $25 million cash. Because as the fiscal note says, under long-term considerations in the first paragraph, additional benefits will be socialized, meaning that all of the tax-paying employers will be paying the, the, the load for those who decided to self-insure and now won't be stepping up and paying back what they've said they would as reimbursable employers. And while this may be boilerplate language, in the past, Senator Frentz, um, we have stepped up to make sure that the taxpaying employers are not uh, being adversely held uh, to cover this cost. Um, I would like to continue my uh, conversation with Senator Hochschild, and so, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll uh, withdraw the amendment to the amendment, but I do have strong feelings about this, and uh, I'll be having a conversation with Senator Champion about maybe looking at reimbursable employers in general, because um, it has been a problem where we've socialized these costs uh, for nonprofits, cities, 
even the state, the state is a, is a reimbursable employer, uh, putting that back mm -hmm. on the premium paying employers. And, and if you're going to self-insure, that's a risk that you take. Um, but it's caused a lot of confusion here about who's paying in and who's not. Um, Cleveland Cliffs, Dino Noble will be paying back in part this benefit along with every other tax paying employer, whether it's uh, you know my, my local VFW who is um, you know runs a restaurant and bar, whether it's my you know small manufacturer, my uh, you know all of our small businesses across the state are covering the cost of this. Now we're not we're not talking about you know the the benefit to these to these workers because you know they're caught in a very very tough situation and that's not what we're you know we're not we're not debating whether or not we want to extend benefits to these employers or to these employees but i do think it's a really bad precedent and maybe it had been set in the past and it's time to change it where we are taking the uh, the responsibility of a certain class of employers and putting it on the on on the bulk of other employers, um, and that was the that was the impetus for the amendment. My guess is, Mr. Rowe, that this is a minimal hit to those uh, 11 employers that weren't discussed yesterday in the in the jobs committee. Um, and I thought I would have that answer prior to this hearing, um, but uh, I think it's caused some confusion. I'll continue to work with Senator Hostile between. Uh, now in the floor session, but I do have very strong feelings about this. Thank you. Um, Senator Pratt has withdrawn the oral amendment to the A8 amendment, so we now have the A8 amendment in front of us. Is there any further discussion of that? Senator Friends. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Thank you, Senator. Senator Pratt, um, you got my promise to recognize the very issue you're talking about, which is the employers that are paying these taxes. As a business owner myself, count on me to be supportive, and I'd like to remind the members we had bipartisan support for the fully funding of the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund a year ago, $2.7 billion. And I'd like to think that that bipartisan support indicates we recognize the balance between employers and employees. For this bill of Senator Hochschild, I'm thinking more about the employees and looking forward to a yes vote. And I'd ask members for a yes vote on the A8 amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Further discussion on the A8 amendment? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. On the bill, the fisc uh, Senator Dames had a question before we get to the fiscal note. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Hostile. As I understand, the uh, most of the benefits uh, started to run out in November of 2022. Is that correct? Uh, Chair Marty, Senator Dames, thank you for the question. Um, that is correct. However, uh, I would be remiss to not mention that there were some staggering of layoffs. And so November was kind of a, a main date that was provided. But if you'll, if you'll look at the notes, we did um, kind of the, the dates that were made by deed in the legislation as suggested made sure that we were covering employees that may have had a unique circumstance with their layoff. So you're, you're asking to go back to make it retroactive back to mid-August. Is that correct? Um, I may defer to deed on that question. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Carlin, did, um, I'm sorry. Uh, Council, did you want to comment? Mr. Yeah. Chair, members, Senator House Child, and I'm sure this is what Mr. Rowe would say as well. But um, I understand we, we do this frequently for unemployment bills when um, we need to do a retroactive date to allow for those people that were. Um, ex that exhausted their, ben their 26 weeks of regular benefits um, prior to today. And so this would allow those people to um, go back and collect additional benefits as provided under this bill with the retroactive effective date. So Senator Hochschild, uh, with that information, how many of those stragglers are there? In other words, if, we're, if, it's, if basically the base is starting in November, you're going back prior to August, those numbers should be available, how many of those people are. How many are there that are going to be going back to the retroactive August time period? Thank you, Senator Dames, or Chair Marty, Senator Dames, for the question. Um, I will defer to Deed for that question. Yes, and I am just 
getting the information. So, um, uh, Chair Marty, uh, Senator Dames, uh, there, I believe there's 490 people in the total population in a, per the fiscal note, and then just I, we're just just getting the data on the retroactive. Um, sorry, <laughs> one moment. Um, the other the other piece I'll just note is we have to be a. Um, uh, Sorry. Um. Oh, okay. Okay, got it. I see. Um, so I'll I'll just note um, the the I'll I'll say the numbers are very. Sm uh, there's there's one in August and one in September, and we are. I'll also just note we're kind of going down a path of where these data are kind of are private, just given the very small number of individuals that we're talking about. So I would, um, but I'll, but the, uh, the, num the number as that we have are one for one, one in each, one in each of those months. One in each one of the months, you say? That's correct, okay. Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Nauman, can you <clears throat> go through the fiscal note briefly? <clears throat> Mr. Chair and members, um, <clears throat> the first thing I'll note for members who may be a little out of practice on fiscal notes that this particular fiscal note does, has a different t file number on the top of it. This is a mechanism that's often used before a bill has a formal Senate file number. So while it says Senate file 9005, this is the proper fiscal note for this particular bill. As we discussed earlier in some of the question period, um, there is a $10.66 million um, expense associated with extend, extending um, an additional 26 weeks for, uh, of, of benefits to the 490 eligible employees that are identified or, uh, or former employees that are identified in the fiscal note. Um, this, this is not a general fund expense. As we, as this com committee often spends a lot of time talking about general funds and other state funds. This is uh, the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund. Um, and you've all been having a robust conversation about how money gets in and out of that trust fund. So if there are any questions about the fiscal note, I'll be happy to en engage that. But the, the calculation to get, arrive at the number is the number of employees times their weekly benefit times 26, which is the extended period. And sometimes in a bill like this, there is an adjustment uh, for the amount of exhaustion of uh, some employees may have exhausted their benefits and others not. In this particular case, the in the agency's judgment and that of the LBO is that it's appropriate to do 100 percent. But, but Mr. Nomadia. But Mr. Nama, the assumption is it will likely be less than the 10.266. Mr. Mr. Chair, I think that's a reasonable inference based on the language that I see in the fiscal note. If the agency has a different assessment of that, but that's certainly how it looks to, to me from the language of the fiscal note. Questions from Mr. Nauman or Senator Pratt? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm not sure if this is for Mr. Nauman or the agency, but I'm looking at the fiscal note, page 2. And it shows the entire expense to the unemployment trust fund in fiscal year 2024, which begins July 1st. But the bill states that we'll be having expenditures in fiscal year 23. And I'm wondering if the agency or Mr. Nauman can explain that discrepancy. Mr. Nauman. Mr. Chair and Senator Pratt, I think I would like to get a little information. I suspect my suspicion is that there's a little bit of a lag. There's a one-year lag on the calculation, but I want to get a little more information before I stand with that answer. Mr. Deputy Commissioner, do you have any? Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, I'm just give me one. Just give me one moment, please.
gets the answer first? Who gets the answer first? Mr. Nelman. <laughs> Mr. Chair, yeah. unless the agency says differently than this, I just consulted with the Legislative Budget Office. It's their feeling there might be a, an oversight in the fiscal note here, and then the, the dollars should be recorded in fiscal 23. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's, that's correct. Um, our, our understanding is that the majority of the expenses would be incurred in the first calendar quarter of, um, of, of 2023, so this current calendar quarter. So, so Mr. Chair, um, with your permission, uh, a question. In a circumstance like this, I think it's appropriate for there to be a revised fiscal note. I'm seeing the LBO director nod to indicate that that would occur. I presume that would occur between this committee and the floor if the committee chose to pass, to act on the bill today. Um, if, uh, as I read the fiscal note, the number itself is not inaccurate. Um, it's just booked in the incorrect fiscal year. Um, and we will ask LBO to update that. Um, is there further discussion on the bill or the fiscal note? If not, Mr. Mr. Chair. Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to offer the A6 amendment. A6 amendment, Senator Pratt is offering. Recognizing it hasn't been distributed yet, but um, Senator Pratt, do you want to start speaking to the amendment or general terms before it's distributed? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, as Senator Hochschild mentioned, um, benefits started uh, exhausting uh, sometime around November for the most part. Um, and the bill extends the, um, the additional benefits to uh, employees that may be laid off between now and March 4th. People who haven't been laid off yet, um, we are proposing to set what effectively becomes a one-year unemployment benefit right out of the chute. Now, I, I understand that he's got, or maybe it's more accurate to say a 10-month unemployment benefit straight out of the chute because he's currently as, as engrossed um, is it, it's expected to expire uh, January 27th. The initial bill had an expiration date for the expended, extended benefits of September 2nd. Now, Mr. Chair, as, as we've gone back and talked about the, um, the retroactivity of, of the benefit to those, to those uh, minors, which and, and the benefit on average is going to be about 21000 per employee, if I do the math of, of uh, you know, a little over $10 million divided by 490, 490 uh, people. But what this also does, Mr. Chair, is it, it begins to ramp down so that uh, somebody who was unemployed and continues to be unemployed, uh, some will get 26 weeks of extended benefits, some 25, some 24, um, just as, you know, it would have been under Senator Hochschild's much extended uh, bill. Um, so, Mr. Chair, we believe that this is a more reasonable uh, impact to bring this down to September. Senator Hochschild's original, um, original proposal, this would not affect anybody's regular benefits. This only affects the extended benefits, and it's hard to say that people who may be laid off between now and March 4th will need extended benefits, but for some of them, they will get them. Uh, for others, we'll begin to phase it out so it becomes a more fair um, uh, process for getting back to a normalized unemployment system. Chair Marty, Senator Pratt, um, thank you for um, the amendment. Um, I think at the end of the day, my goal has always been 
to look out for miners on the Iron Range. Given the circumstances that were completely out of their control, let's do this right. Let's do this quickly and get these benefits that have been uh, arguably delayed um, through the winter months and, and the holiday season. Um, and let's not leave a worker behind. Let's not, uh, on a whim, create abstract new dates that may leave out a worker here or there for the sake of, of you know, trying to, to, to fix a small, a small deal. Um, I, you know, I want to make sure that the workers in this area that were impacted by this decision that was completely out of their hands uh, are covered. Um, it's, it's likely that this amendment would impact very few workers, if any at all. Um, so in my interpretation, why, uh, why make the change that could impact somebody's life um, when it's, in my mind, unnecessary in this case? If I could, and I'm not sure if this is um, appropriate, Chair Marty, but I'd like to ask uh, my colleague, Senator Eichhorn, a question. I'm looking to ask members of the committee. Thank you. Sen Senator Eichhorn, you're a co-author on the bill. I'm, I'm interested. What is your perspective on this amendment? Are you okay with possible workers being left out of the unemployment extension as part of this legislation? Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, Senator Housechild, um, you yourself just said you didn't believe that anybody would possibly be left out. Uh, again, this is in line with the bill you asked me to sign on to. I think it's a fair proposal by Senator Platt, Pratt. Again, if you don't have any concrete evidence to say somebody's going to be left behind, uh, it, it's hard to go with that extended date. I think it sets a bad precedence. I certainly don't want anybody to be left behind. Um, but again, I haven't seen any data to see that anybody would be left behind, and you, again, kind of stated so yourself. Chair Marty, I, just to clarify, I didn't say nobody would be left out. I said it's likely a small number of employees that, that could be left out. Deputy Commissioner. Uh, um, my my understanding, um, uh, Chair Marty, um, uh, Senator Eichhorn, um, so my understanding is that this is really about um, making sure that if, you know, if circumstances in the future, right, if there are additional layoffs that we can't predict right now, um, that, that those workers would be eligible for this program. I'll just note, um, you know, so it's really kind of meant to be, to provide an abundance of caution if there are further layoffs within that, um, you know, with, within, the, within, that, within those employers. And I'll just, I'll just note for historical context, you know, in, like in 2016, um, that we, there, there was an open, there was an open-ended approach to that. Um, whereas this time, I think there, there is the, there is the date in, in, in the legislation. Further discussion, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd like to, to correct maybe some of Senator Hochschild's comments just a little bit. Um, you know, this is not an arbitrary date. This was the date that he originally put in his bill. This is the date that the fiscal note was drafted upon. And so to say that it's an arbitrary date, I think, is, is a little bit disingenuous. Um, there's no evidence that we need to extend this out uh, an additional year from today. Uh, because what, as Senator Hochschild said, this is about people last fall, right? Retroactively, last fall. These were people that ran out of benefits and were trying to help them overcome a financial hardship. This is not about extending a benefit beyond what is the traditional norm of 26 weeks benefit. And we'd even agree that, okay, we'll extend the benefits for some of those who haven't run out. But to, to almost guarantee someone an immediate 12 months before they've even been laid off on a bill that was meant to be a stopgap, a safety net for those who have already experienced hardship is contra to, to what Senator Hochschild said the initial objective of the bill is. Um, oh, Mr. Chair, I had a second thought, but I, I had a senior moment here. I apologize. Sure. And I was on such a roll. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know what I, and, you know, and to Senator Hochschild's uh, uh, introductory comments, um, you know, I think we, you know, had the governor, and only the governor can call a special session, had the governor called a special session, we probably would have passed something very similar to his original bill, and it would have ended in September 2nd. 
And so, uh, you know, Mr. Chair, I think this is a very reasonable amendment that uh, reins in the amount of extended benefits. If there's a continued problem, we'll still be in session. Um, but I think it's I think it sets a very bad precedent for us to go ahead and extend an additional 26 weeks of benefits to someone who hasn't even been furloughed yet. Chair Marty, uh, can I ask for a clarifying uh, question from Council Council uh, Fontaine? In previous UI extensions, it's my understanding that this that this date was not in place. That it in fact was was laid open for the benefits to be exhausted by the employees. Is that, am I saying that correctly? Well, Mr. Chair, members and Center House Child, I, I would have to look back at the 2016, that was kind of what this bill sure. was based off of, but sure. it looks, I don't believe there was an, an end date, but I can't say for certain, I would have to pull that up. Thank you. Senator Brett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I, what I can say, uh, having been intimately involved in the discussions was that we did in fact have parameters in 2020 uh, around extended benefits uh, with COVID. And so you may be able to find old precedent uh, that would support an open date. You'd, you'd also find precedent that would have a very defined period. And we do have a defined period. We're saying up until March 4th. But what we've never done, Mr. Chair, is, is in, and even in 20, even in 2020, we only extended those benefits out until the beginning of April. Um, we did 13 weeks. We extended them out until the beginning of April. And so this is not out of the norm. This is not unprecedented. And I think it's a very reasonable uh, uh, request to say that we're helping the miners who have experienced financial hardship, but we think those who have not... And, and those who are already laid off will have this benefit uh, most likely for the entire, for the entire extension. But uh, for those who are not laid off yet, we're not granting them a 10 or 12 month automatic uh, uninsurance uh, benefit. And so, Mr. Chair, I, I think, again, Senator Hochschild, this is not unprecedented. Uh, Mr. Rowe can go back and quote 2016, but I can quote 2020. And, um, I think it's a I, I think it's a reasonable request, and it goes back to the original intent of the bill, so it's not an arbitrary date. If there, let's let's vote uh, move on this because we MMB is we're running out of time quickly. But if, if there's no further discussion on the A6 amendment, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. No. Motion does not prevail. <laughs> Mr. Chair, ahead, division. division. All those in favor, raise their hand. All those opposed. The vote. Um, the motion does not prevail. Um, on the bill, did we we did adopt the A eight, and um, is there any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed. Motion prevails. Senator Hauschild, congratulations. The bill is on its way to the floor. Thank, Thank you. you to Dean. Um, we will quickly move over to MMB. I apologize for the misjudgment of projection what time you'd be on. Commissioner, welcome to the committee. And you, if you want to start by introducing folks who are here and then um, go ahead with the presentation. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, my name is Jim Showalter, Commissioner of Minnesota Management and Budget. Appreciate the chance to be here to present the November uh, budget and economic forecast. With me is Dr. Laura Columbakitis and State Budget Director Anna Mingi. Um, Playing part-time tech help is our new legislative director, George Shardlow, um, and uh, also uh, uh, Lucy Tao, who is uh, new to our team as well, is in the back, our new legislative coordinator. So I'm sure we'll be uh, all you'll be working with them throughout the session. 
Um, Mr. Chair, just a quick question in terms of timing. How fast do you want me to talk? Uh, how much we should compress? How much questions in time for questions and answers would you um, prefer? You can go through it fairly quickly because I mean, so lots of members of the committee have already seen some most of the presentation and so on, um, and there may be questions. So brevity is probably smarter just because we have till 1030 and so on. Excellent. Uh, we will do that. Uh, we have it plugged in, but I don't see it on your screen, so we're only halfway home mm. at the moment. Very good. I will start uh, because, you know, my intro is not exactly data intensive. Uh, thank you for the chance to present. I, obviously, uh, you know the story is going to end with good news. Uh, it, it really is a point in time uh, forecast. What we do is we take the best information we can get from the national forecasters. We add it to our revenue information that we're collecting and spending information and put it into a point in time uh, expenditure outlook. It's something we do twice a year, as this committee well knows. It is sort of one of our mature practices that forms a baseline for decision making both for the governor and for the legislature. Uh, the November forecast was released in early uh, December and it really much of the news was uh, kind of already known. You, know, we, you knew that we ended up uh, le left session with a $7 billion uh, budget balance. We knew that we had a structural balance going forward into the budget period. And we also knew that our revenue collections were significantly running ahead of expectations. What that all comes together um, is a significant uh, starting point for the upcoming uh, budget figure. It's a lot for anyone to take in. In the current year, uh, we're looking at that $7 billion starting point improving by an additional $5 billion, getting us to a starting point of $12 billion, sort of from revenues already uh, essentially realized. On top of that, looking at the structural improvement, uh, you, you see the key points here now uh, popping onto the slide, is that you know, what you're seeing is about $18 billion of uh, budget uh, expected for this upcoming biennium. And although uh, that's obviously very good news, there are cautions and notes of caution that we'll include in the forecast, whether it's uh, the effects of inflation, whether it's the effects of a slowing economy, um, and uh, the, this forecast does include a mild recession uh, coming up. I started to talk verbally about some of these numbers, but this just gives you a quick pictorial look at that starting point uh, going from the end of session to the November forecast. The starting point was already um, unusually high uh, with uh, a $7 billion, basically, money in the bank with an additional $5 billion expected as structural improvement in the 24-25 biennium. In this forecast, both of those figures improve, though most of it is the money in the rearview mirror, moving from $7 billion to $12 billion, the structural position going from five to six. This is what you would expect to start seeing it in numbers. This is the highest level, kind of look at the fund balance. What you see here is the beginning balance moving from $7 billion, uh, growing to about $12 billion in that 22-23 biennium, really as a result of significant improvement in our revenue picture, most of which was presaged by those monthly revenue collection numbers and a decrease, boosted by a decrease in spending. And much of that is really tied to improved uh, or lower spending uh, due to improved federal help, I'm um, assumed, in the forecast, reducing some of our Medicaid expenditures. In the 24-25 biennium, we see those changes continue through, but at a much smaller amount. Revenues improved, but a much smaller amount. Spending drops, but again, by a much smaller amount, leaving to a bottom line of about $17.6 billion. Total change in the forecast, $5.5 billion, is not an unprecedented change. The cumulative effect of it, though, is, I think, what is really, really unusual. The, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Laura Kalambakidis. As you know, she's a, a professor at the University of Minnesota. Uh, has been working uh, with, as a state uh, economist for the last 10 years, and uh, uh, she'll walk through the economy and the revenue impacts in this forecast, Mr. Chair. Welcome to the committee, Dr. Columbo Uh Thank you, Chair Marty. Um, for the record, I'm Laura Columbo state economist. So I'm going to start talking about the U.S. economic outlook and how it changed between February of 22 through to November of 22. Then I'll talk about Minnesota's economy, and then I'll talk about revenues. So since we prepared, the, in, the, in the months that we 
uh, prepared our forecast from February to November of 22, um, the global and U.S. economies saw dramatic changes. So those included the Russian invasion of Ukraine, high inflation. In response to that inflation, uh, six Federal Reserve actions to raise interest rates as of November, but now there's been another, uh, a seventh. Um, as a result of those factors, the outlook for U.S. real GDP growth weakened. So uh, what you're seeing is uh, the forecast for U.S. real GDP growth from our uh, consulting firm, IHS. The dark bars show the history and their uh, November 22 forecast. The light blue bars show their February 22 forecast. Um, IHS, ex as of November, IHS expected annual real GDP to grow 1.8% in 22. That's less than half of the 3.7% they were expecting in February of 22. Um, real GDP was, as of their November outlook, expected to decline 0.2% this year, 23, as the U.S. economy moves through a recession, with the unemployment rate rising to 5.7%. In contrast, in February, IHS expected real GDP to increase 2.7% in 23, and the unemployment rate to average 3.5%. So since the no their November outlook, we've gotten two more monthly updates from IHS. And so in their January update, um, things have gotten a little better. Uh, they now expect U.S. real GDP to uh, have been 2% um, in uh, calendar year 22. And while they, con they continue to have a mild recession in the forecast for this year, they have moved the starting point from the end of 22 to this current quarter, the beginning of 23. Uh, so they have two quarters of contraction, meaning declining GDP at the beginning of this year. And their annual uh, forecast for GDP, real GDP for 23 is now positive half a percent. So instead of that minus 0.2, they now have plus 0.5 and then they have 1.8% for 24. So the economic story, the qualitative story is still the same. It's still a mild recession this year. It's still an economic slowdown. It's still uh, um, upward pressure on the unemployment rate. It's just that everything is softened and pushed a little further into the future. When I say a mild recession, um, I'm looking at the average peak to trough uh, change in um, uh, real GDP, and the average peak to trough decline in real GDP uh, from, from pre-2008, so pre the Great Recession, was 1.7%. In the January outlook from IHS, that peak to trough decline is 0.6%. So that's what we mean by mild, is relatively low peak to trough decline. Uh, they do uh, have had in November, and they continue to have now, slower growth projected through the, all the years of the forecast, with average annual increases in real GDP of 1.9% for 25 through 27, down from an average of 2.5% per year in the prior forecast. Um, that's due to lower forecasts for both productivity and the size of the U.S. labor force. And that slower growth move, looking out is a risk in itself because when the economy is growing slowly, then uh, it's, it, it doesn't take that much of a negative shock to push us into back into negative territory. In the next chart, uh, we'll discuss uh, one of the, you know, the big story of the economy is inflation. Um, the height of the bar shows annual change in the consumer price index. Uh, so last year, higher prices, including for food and rent, drove inflation to what is now expected to have been 8.1% in 22. Uh, that's 3.6 percentage points higher than forecast in February. IHS expects slowing demand, consistent with that, with that recession, uh, continuing supply chain normalization, and the eventual softening of the labor market conditions, so that upward pressure on the unemployment rate, all of those things are going to slow inflation. And they forecast, that are, and as of the time that we released, since we released the November forecast, inflation numbers have been coming in um, below expectation. And so that some of that decline has already occurred. Um, so IHS forecasts CPI inflation to fall to 4.3% in 23 and then 2.7% in 22. All of those numbers that you see in that chart as of their January outlook are a little lower. Okay, so inflation, their inflation expectations have come in or come down since November. 
The next chart is related to that inflation story. So in response to that high inflation, uh, the Federal Reserve has changed their path of monetary policy relative to what we expected a year ago in the February of 22 forecast. So this chart shows the level of the federal funds rate, the, the policy rate for the Federal Reserve. The dark line shows the history. The dashed line shows the November 22 outlook. And the dotted line shows what they expected in February of 22. Um, and you can see that the path changed dramatically between the time we released our February forecast and the time we released our November forecast. Uh, so the Federal Reserve, in response to higher inflation, trying to bring in that inflation, uh, raised the rate six times, seven times in 22, and four of those were those 75 basis point jumbo increases. Um, and that's a significant acceleration from the path we expected in February. IHS now expects the Fed to raise that rate to 5% by March, reverse March of this year, reverse course in the spring of next year, and bring the rate below 3% in 25. And that's consistent with their expectation that inflation will settle after 24, which we saw in the last chart. So in this forecast, these higher interest rates have some impacts. They slow business and residential investment, which are both um, interest rate sensitive sectors. So those are the sectors that are being affected here um, and are being affected in this projected mild recession. And it raises the return on Minnesota's general fund cash balances. So you'll see both of the impacts of both of those things in the revenue forecast. The next chart shows wage and salary income growth. So this is the sum, the annual growth in the sum of all the payrolls in the United States. Um, again, the dark bars are the history and the November outlook, and the light bars are the February outlook. IHS ex, um, expects this economic slowdown to moderate the U.S. labor market. They forecast U.S. nominal wage income growth of 8.8% last year, um, which is a decrease from February. And then they've, uh, they have lowered their forecast in all the, um, the subsequent years. Um, this occurs as the US unemployment rate is expected to rise uh, in, this, in 23 and stay above 4.5% through our planning horizon. Moving to Minnesota's labor market, this chart, uh, the next chart shows, thank you. Uh, shows the uh, headline unemployment rate for the U.S. and for Minnesota. The U.S. unemployment rate is the light line, and Minnesota's unemployment rate is the dark line. Minnesota's is, is almost e at every point below the U.S., and the vertical gray bars are U.S. recessions. Minnesota has one of the tightest labor markets in the country. As of October, which is the data on this chart, um, the unemployment rate was 2.1%, the lowest among states, and 1.6 percentage points below the U.S. rate. Uh, the, that, as of November, that has since Minnesota's unemployment rate has gone up a bit to 2.3%, um, and the, un, the U.S. unemployment rate stayed at 37 We also have the story of um, that since the um, pandemic, we have lost labor force, so people have, our labor force has fallen, and that is due to retirements um, or to people staying home to care for children other, and other reasons. Um, since uh, February of 2020, our labor force has fallen by 92,000, and the labor force participation rate has declined by 2.8 percentage points. Nevertheless, at 68%, Minnesota's labor force participation rate remains high relative to the U.S. So the U.S. Unemployment, or labor force participation rate came down too, and it's come down in, in um, states in general. Um, so our labor force participation rate is still 5.8 percentage points above the U.S. rate and is the fifth highest among U.S. states. There's a strong demand for workers across the state. I'm sure all of you know. We have only four unemployed job seekers for every 10 job openings. So that means there's less slack in our labor market than in other parts of the country. The next chart shows our forecast for annual change in Minnesota employment. So, the, oops, there's, should, yeah, thank you. Uh, so this is change in total number of jobs in Minnesota annually. Um, Note that even in the February, for, well, first of all, if you look back at 18 and 19, you can see our, our annu actual annual job change was less than 1%. And so we had relatively slow employment growth back then that was because our labor, su labor supply, our labor force growth was slow and was restricting um, the employer's ability to add jobs. Then look at our, the light blue bars for our February forecast, and you see that we didn't have an, uh, a particularly exuberant 
uh, forecast for employment growth even back in February. We had that coming back down uh, following the, um, the pandemic. And now it's with this uh, recession in the forecast, our employment growth is expected to slow further. We expect job gains to decelerate from 3.1% in 22 to 0.3% in 23. And then we expect, expect employment to remain flat over 24 as workers who lose jobs are picked up by other employers and then growth picks back up after that. Next, we'll move to the revenue forecast. Uh, the first two columns show the current forecast and the forecast change for the current biennium. And the second two columns show the same thing for the next biennium. As you heard from Commissioner Showalter, since uh, February of 22, general fund receipts have significantly exceeded our forecast. And those higher tax receipts at the close of fiscal year 22 and the first part of fiscal year 23 raise the revenue forecast for the current biennium. Total tax revenues, and so I'm focusing on that subtotal total tax revenue line. Total tax revenues for the current biennium are now forecast to be $2.7 billion more than the February forecast, and we raised the forecasts for all the major tax types. For the next, uh, the total tax revenues for the next biennium are now forecast to be $288 million less than the February forecast. So we have lower forecasts for individual income and other tax revenues, and those offset higher forecasts for sales and corporate. So the impact of that expected economic slowdown is seen in the next biennium forecast for individual income tax uh, receipts, which are now expected to be $975 million less than we projected in February. So that's due to lower assumed wage, uh, wage growth, which is consistent with that U.S. wage growth chart I showed you, and lower forecast growth in non-wage income. In addition, uh, higher inflation chain raises indexing for the income tax, and that takes some money out uh, in the next biennium. For both the sales and corporate taxes, the forecast is raised, but that's due to the higher base um, from the current biennium being higher, uh, even though we, the forecasts for both consumer sales and um, corporate profits are lower in the next biennium than we had in February. The corporate tax is projected to generate $832 million more revenue than the prior estimate. We have raised the forecast since February, again, because the starting point is higher. The new forecast, though, actually represents a decline in expected corporate receipts from the current biennium to the next. Um, and that occurs as the lower economic forecast creates drag on the corporate sector. Among other tax revenues, we have a, a smaller, for, a lower forecast for deed transfer and mortgage taxes. Those are both getting uh, affected by those higher mortgage interest rates. And so we have lower refinancing and lower home sale activity. We've also separated um, non-tax revenues or all other revenue in the table, so you can see how that changed. That, that this change is different than what we usually see. Um, this value is $564 million more in the current biennium and $698 million more in the next biennium than in Feb the February forecast. And that's primarily due to an increased forecast for investment income. So that is that interest rate impact on um, the, the rate, rate of return the state earns on its cash balances. Some of the forecast risks, uh, you know, I mentioned inflation is the big story. It has been coming in. Um, if it doesn't continue that path down, uh, then this could cause the Fed to act even more aggressively than they've acted now um, and pro prolong interest rate increases, and that could slow economic growth. Moreover, monetary policy works with long and difficult to predict lags. So even if inflation and monetary policy follow exactly the path that IHS laid out in the, their November outlook, um, that path could result in a different outcome uh, than IHS expects. Um, I talked already about the, the long-term slow, slow growth. I want to emphasize some of the volatile sectors that affect the revenue forecast. The corporate and sector and financial markets are volatile and dynamic, and in recent years have not always behaved in predictable ways. So it's difficult to estimate how much this aggressive monetary policy and a forecast recession is going to affect those, um, those sectors and consequently affect the revenue that we get from, for instance, the corporate tax and cap taxation of capital gains realizations. Um, I'm, I don't know if you want me to take questions now or should we pass it on to Budget Director Mingi? We'll go ahead with Director Mingi. 
Good morning, Chair Marty. I'm Anna Mingi, um, State Budget Director with MMB. And I'm going to walk through changes on the sp um, spending side of the state budget. So this table uh, lays out changes in general fund spending in the current biennium and the next. It's similar to the tables that um, the Commissioner and Dr. Kalambakitis just walked through. Uh, overall, spending changes were a significant part of the November forecast story. In the current biennium, they were down about 2.9% relative to prior estimates. And in the 24-25 um, budget biennium, the spending forecast was down about 1.1%. So I'm going to start by walking through changes in the current biennium. You can see on the first line, E12 education is, the, as you all know, the largest part of the general fund budget. There, um, we projected $280 million in lower spending in the relative to the end of session estimates. This is driven primarily by lower pupil counts, and I have an additional slide to discuss that in greater detail. On the next line, Health and Human Services is projected to spend $1.1 billion, um, few, less in the current biennium than end of session estimates. This is largely the result of additional federal funds due to several extensions of the federal public health emergency. But these savings also reflect higher anticipated pharmacy rebate payments in our Medicaid program and lower than expected managed care rates for the coming or for the current calendar year 2023. You can see that spending on property tax aids and credits is relatively unchanged, but our projected spending for debt service is $43 million or about 3.6% lower than prior estimates, which is driven primarily by lower spending on currently authorized bonding projects, as state agencies um, have spent slightly slower, resulting in a smaller bond sale in the summer of 2022. All other areas of the state budget are combined $89 million below previous estimates. I just want to note that number Normally, we don't have a number that big on that line, and it's not actually lower spending. It's generally a result of spending moving across lines in our financial statements. You may recall last session, the legislature appropriated $190 million to Minnesota management and budget for COVID management costs. And as MMB has allocated those costs to state agencies, we've moved them, they've moved to those bill areas. For example, the Department of Health has received a significant amount of money of, out of this um, pot of money, which means we, the fund statement shows those expenditures showing up in Health and Human Services rather than the state government bill area. So um, just to explain why that number might look larger than you're used to seeing. So moving to the um, budget years, 24-25 biennium, you can see looking at the bottom that total spending is forecast to reach almost $54 billion. On the first line, E12 education, the forecast is relatively unchanged compared to prior estimates. Um, but what's going on in the education forecast is two trends moving in opposite directions. The savings from lower pupils continues into the budget years, but those savings are offset by higher payments through compensatory education revenue. In Health and Human Services, total spending um, is forecast to reach $17.8 billion, a reduction of $722 million from previous estimates. The largest driver of this change is lower rates paid to managed care organizations in calendar year 2023. In every eligibility category in our MA program, actual rates for 2023 um, are lower than we previously forecast they would be. This was driven by lower than expected costs um, in actual experience. So property tax aids and credits, the next line, the forecast is $130 million above previous estimates. This is a result of higher property tax refunds as property values have grown faster than household income. Um, you can see spending and debt service in other areas of the budget is relatively unchanged, which leads to a total reduction of $600 million in state general fund spending. So I wanted to spend um, just a moment looking more closely at the trends in our pupil forecast. You can see this slide shows 20 years of actual and projected um, experience with our pupil counts. And the forecast period is really expanded um, from that dotted line box into the smaller chart. 
So the reduction in pupils is relatively small. It's about a 1.5% reduction in pupils from the previous forecast, but that does drive significant changes in state spending. So the Department of Education uses near-term growth trends based on historical data and other factors to project pupils. And in this case, preliminary data for the 2021 and 2022 st school year shows that we had about 1.4% fewer pupils than previously expected. And because of that lower actual data, the forecast lowered the base from which we project future growth, which resulted in a downward shift from the previous forecast. So that's the previous forecast is the dashed line. Um, moving down to the solid line is the current forecast. But what you also see on this chart is just a long-term reduction in pupils year over year, which is explained by declining birth rates to Minnesota residents. Another significant change in state expenditures was savings in health and human services due to a reduction in medical assistance spending as a result of extensions of the federal public health emergency. And this chart breaks out those impacts in the um, current biennium and the next. Uh, relative to general fund spending. So you all are aware that as a part of the federal Families First Coronavirus Response Act, the state receives an additional 6.2% in um, federal match on medical assistance for each calendar quarter in which a federal public health emergency related to COVID remains active for at least one day. And since March of 2020, the state has benefited from over $2.6 billion in additional federal funds. The February forecast, the basis for our prior estimates, assumed that the public health emergency would expire in April of 2022. However, since then, the Federal Secretary of Health and Human Services has issued three 90-day extensions of the public health emergency. So the current forecast assumes the state will receive additional federal match through March of 2023. And those three additional quarters provide an additional $762 million in federal matching dollars. However, in order to receive that enhanced funding, the state has to maintain continuous coverage for our medical assistance enrollees, which means that in general, individuals are not removed from coverage with, with a limited set of exceptions. This results in higher enrollment, which drives some higher costs to the state, which offsets a portion of those state savings. So you can see on the chart, the net savings to the state in the current biennium is about $603 million. However, because of the time it will take to um, unwind those continuous coverage provisions, there are some costs that occur in the 24 and 25 biennium. So in net, across these two biennia, the savings to the state is about $500 million, but the savings are really concentrated in the first year, uh, first biennium with some costs lagging into the second biennium. Um, I would note that the recent federal appropriations law has changed the interaction of the federal public health emergency and the additional um, enhanced FMAP and continuous coverage provisions, and those updates will be reflected in our February forecast. So with that, I'll turn it back to the commissioner. Commissioner. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I just thought the last slide that we have here is the long-term budget outlook. If you pull it all together, um, you know, the committee has gone from very specific detailed discussion with Deed about business level, taxation, activity, uh, UI to macroeconomic factors, and this slide kind of pulls it all together. It's like, where are we going? Uh, what does the current biennium look like? What's the future look like? What are some of the other factors? The first, uh, on this table, you see on the left-hand column, 24 and 25. The revenues that are collected in that biennium compared with the spending in that biennium yield what we call a structural balance, which is about $6.3 billion. That is, the revenues that we're collecting are anticipated to exceed what we're ex current law expecting to spend based on this forecast and these assumptions. What this does not include is the inflation. As you know, statute says that inflation is not included in these estimates. It is on the revenue side, it is not on the spending, but we estimate that at CPI at about $1.6 billion, shown underneath that line. Going to the right, you'll see the 26-27 column. So that's a four-year projection, a three and a four-year projection. Obviously, it's the most variability, most uncertainty in those figures. Uh, but what you see there is we are still anticipating the projected current law revenues exceeding spending by about $8.4 billion. Again, same admonition about the impact of inflation. That's included underneath the line. 
those are healthy numbers, those are strong numbers, but those are also sort of the long range context that the Finance Committee and members generally need to keep in mind as we're uh, moving through the session. So, um, Mr. Chair, I just really appreciate the chance to present this, bring this forward, answer questions. There's a lot of information that we've given you in sort of speed date kind of format. There's a lot more information on our website, uh, whether uh, it is particular accounts, other funds outside the general fund that you're interested in. Um, but with that, Mr. Chair, happy to take any questions of the committee behalf. Thank you. And, and on the inflation thing, I'll note that um, I'm asking the committee to consider, I think it's on Thursday, a bill to incorporate the inflation into the forecast in the future, repeal that provision of law, which you see the numbers there. But I also point out that those are the numbers basically going forward, the impact over the inflation the next couple of years. And, and as I think I've talked with you about some, that if we calculate what the legislature thought it was providing two years ago and what it would take to keep that up is a much higher number. And I understand your folks and Mr. Nauman have been, at my request, trying to come up with a calculation for that. So uh, discussion, questions, anything for members of the committee? Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, quick question for Ms. Mingi. Um, going back to your slide on, on the public health emergency extension, uh, if the federal government decides to extend the public health emergency even further, uh, when is that decision point? Ms. Mingi. So the um, the current federal public health emergency ends this month, and so likely any extension would come in the you know, next week or two. But uh, the, um, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Chair, Senator, but the, as a result of the federal appropriations law, the um, COVID unwind will, states need to start in April, April 1 of 2023. And that will start a 12-month clock. And the federal, the enhanced match will drop to 5% for the quarter beginning April 1 of 2023, then to 2.5% in the quarter beginning July, and 1.5% in the quarter beginning in October. And so the extensions of the public health emergency um, are no longer, don't no longer have the same bearing on the state budget in the way that they did previously because of the actions the federal government took in December. So, so Ms. Mingi, if the, the federal government, they, it sounds like they already have a ramp down of the benefits, but if they were to extend that ramp down, when would they have to make that decision? Um, Ms. Mingi. Mr. Chair, Senator, I think the, I, I would need to review the law, but I believe that the ramp down is now specified in federal law, and so extensions of the, so they would need an active Congress to, to change the ramp down. Okay. Thank you. And before we adjourn, um, Mr. Shargo and Ms. Tao are folks in the back of your legislative liaisons and so on. So, well, welcome. We look forward to dealing with you as well. Um, is there further discussion? If not, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just had uh, one, more, one more question. Um, maybe, to, maybe to tee up the discussion for Thursday a little bit. Uh, Commissioner Showalter, you said that the estimated inflation was based on CPI. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Department of Revenue is, is using chain CPI, which is slightly different. Can you tell me why we have a discrepancy in those calculations? Mr. Chair, uh, Senator, great question, um, and I'm going to try. Uh, but I, I, the, the use of CPI in here is really just consistent with our, our past history. You know, when inflation was uh, part of the forecast, uh, that was the, the measure that was used. And so uh, rather than change, there's obviously many different measures of CPI, but that is what we're using. Um, I look to my left to uh, Dr. K uh, if there's uh, any further explanation about okay. chain CPI versus CPI. Dr. Um, Mr. Chair, Senator, um, my understanding is, so DOR uses change CPI for index, for the indexing. Um, I'm sorry, what? Uh, for indexing the income tax, so in the indexing the brackets. Uh, they, and that's a statutory requirement. I think the legislature m requires that. Um, I, don't, I don't know where else that requirement would have come from. Um, and the difference is that uh, CPI measures the change in the cost of a bundle of goods. 
change CPI assumes that consumers will substitute away from more expensive goods toward less expensive goods mm -hmm. um, that are pure substitutes for one another, and so it, tend, it doesn't increase as much. So that's the difference between the two indices. Um, I do not recall the, the legislative conversation about requiring chain CPI for indexing, but that's, but that's the difference between the two. Mr. Chair. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, and I know Congress changed the, the indexing back in 2017 from CPI to chain CPI on the, on the tax brackets as well. Here's my concern, that there's a slight difference between the two measurements. And if we're going to be using one to estimate revenue and the other to estimate spending, which must be funded by that revenue, it seems reasonable to me that the two indices ought to be the same. And so that's, I, I, I would appreciate it if it's not too difficult, would you be able to recalculate those, uh, the, the uh, estimated inflation on slide 18 to be what, what that would look like under chain CPI? Mr. Chair, Senator. And then, you know, Mr. Chair, I appreciate the, um, if, if I may. Please. Thank you. Sorry, I'm still getting used to the uh, protocol around here. It's been a long interim. Uh, Mr. Chair, I just, you know, I, I appreciate that, uh, you know, as we're looking on slide three, we do see a structural, uh, a structural surplus, uh, five billion uh, for the remainder of this biennium and another six billion next year. Um, a surplus that's being funded by Minnesota taxpayers, Minnesota small businesses, Minnesota families, um, well in excess of what's even being calculated by the CPI and potentially chain CPI um, inflation estimates. And so I think it should be um, very top of mind, not only for this committee, but for the tax committee to be looking at um, recognizing that and making sure that Minnesota, Minnesota families get a tax break to help them and their family budgets uh, cope with the, the, inf the impact of generational inflation. Thank you. Further discussion? If not, we will adjourn Mr. this. Mr. Chair, one, one oh, quick sorry. question. May I? Sure, uh, question ahead. for I'm the sorry. chair, not for the testifiers. I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Chair, last week we had a long conversation in the, in the chamber about uh, proportionality on committees. Um, you and I had a conversation on the floor that, that you were going to talk to Senator Dietzik. I talked to Senator Dietzik. She said she was going to be talking to you. Um, you know, I can only talk about my experience on this committee that... Um, in the, in the past, when I've served on this committee, we've had a two-vote margin um, with a very similar uh, split in the chamber. Um, and, uh, Mr. Chair, I would, while, while I, I don't expect finance to necessarily be in compliance with the letter of the law, I would hope that the finance committee uh, is in compliance with the spirit of the law, and I appreciate your history um, in this institution and... and your reverence for the for the dignity and the and the uh, uh, not only for the institution itself but for the rules of the institution and I would encourage you to uh, as you have further conversations with Senator Dietzik, look at adding another member of the minority uh, to this committee. Thank you, Senator Pratt, and those conversations are underway. And with that being no further discussion, this committee will be adjourned. <laughs>